Assalamu alaikum. Um, on the Friends of Bangladeshis, today we have a very special guest. Um, the Bangladeshi community is moving forward. Uh, it is all because of the community's hard work, their parents' dedication, but we must not forget our friends who have been an inspiration to the community. And today we have a special guest. He's none other than Paul Scully. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, before we start, uh, talking to him. Let's go for a uh, clip. Paul Scully was elected as a member of parliament for Sutton and Chim in 2015 and held the seat in the 2017 general election. He first visited Bangladesh in 2010 with the Parliamentary Social Action Project and built schools and sports club. After being elected as an MP, Paul Scully became the chairman of all party parliamentary group for British catering industry. He is a loud voice for the catering industry and strongly raises the struggle faced by the catering industry to the government. For his support to the catering industry, Paul Scully is known as a curry minister to the community. Viewers, we have just seen a clip on uh, Paul Scully MP. And now we are going to talk about uh, different areas, catering industry, community and so on and so forth. So Paul, uh, when did you become MP uh, first? I was first elected in the 2015 um, election mm -hmm. for uh, the constituency of Sutton and Cheam in South mm -hmm. London and then obviously just been re-elected uh, recently in the 2017 election. So only two years, relatively new boy. But uh, you have already become a curry minister. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd love to. Yes, yeah, so there's the chairman for the uh, for the all party parliamentary we'll, we'll group. For the in a second. But the curry minister is so much easier to say. <laughs> yes. We'll come back to that in a second. Uh, how, you have family? I do have family, so I have a wife and two children. Two children. Um, I think my interest in the area as well is because my father was born in Burma, so that's mm -hmm. already given me a sort of eclectic Asian international uh, viewpoint, mm -hmm. yes. Excellent. Tell us about um, the involvement within um, various committees within the parliament. So uh, for the last six months I've sat on the International Development Committee, which is obviously again crucial to Bangladesh and the mm -hmm. region, uh, the Petitions Committee, so we, s we sit on, uh, uh, and decide on what happens to e-petitions that go on the government uh -huh. website when people want to petition the government to do something, and I often lead debates mm -hmm. in a number of areas, including immigration, including mm -hmm. Brexit and, uh, um, and the NHS, etc. So that's been really interesting over the last couple of years. How did you get acquainted with the Bangladeshi community? I think there's a number of routes. My, uh, my business partner, as Chowdhury, for the company that I founded a few years back, Nudge Factory, yeah. which is still going, he's Bangladeshi, um, and his father owned restaurants, um, and he's very well ensconced in the Bangladeshi well. community. Uh, and so, so that, that was uh, really piqued my interest. And then I first went with a number of MPs when we did a social action project in Bangladesh in 2010. 2010. And it, that's when I really fell in love with the country as well. Excellent, excellent. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> okay, so when you went to Bangladesh in 2010, mm. that time you went an MP. No, I wasn't an MP. I was a volunteer. So I went with Anne Main, uh -huh. uh, with Nicky Morgan, Andrew Stevenson, and, uh, mm -hmm. and a couple of other um, uh -huh. uh, members of Parliament at that okay. time, who have become my friends and colleagues now. And something happened in during that time in the hotel. Yeah, we had uh, we had an earthquake. So uh, it was quite an extraordinary um, event. Uh, it was T Tobias Elwood was one of the other members of parliament there, mm -hmm. and he really showed his uh, his military heroic background because he led us out of the um, of the hotel, hotel? Uh, evacuated was the hotel. Was it in Dhaka? Or it was in Silet. The the earth earthquake had happened in Nepal, travelled through Silet, and and actually um, did quite a bit of damage in Dhaka as well. Okay. But actually, one of the uh, funny things about that story is that because we'd come back. Uh, mid-afternoon to get changed before we went out for dinner mm -hmm. I think with the Chamber of Commerce that night um, we couldn't go back into the hotel so we had to go straight to our dinner with and so you had Nicky Morgan who's become a Secretary of State and things since doing a speech in front of the Chamber of Cap Commerce of Select in her pajamas. Pajamas. <laughs> so, so <laughs> that is I'm sure very she'll love me telling you that story. That is very <laughs> interesting very interesting. So uh, what was the purpose of that visit? Well, one of the things was, and uh, I've, I've been again since, and looking to go in another few weeks, is, is we tend to do social action. So we, we like politicians talk a lot. We like to do things. Um, so that day we re, uh, that trip we refurbished a, a, a secondary school. Mm -hmm. We went teaching in a primary school. Set up um, the uh, Select Tigers Sports Academy. Mm -hmm. Um, and really felt that we left a bit of a legacy behind with the volunteers mm -hmm. and, the, and the members of parliament. And then we did go to Dakar and, uh, and had political 
uh, discussions with uh, both at that time at Sheikh, Sheikh Asina and Khalid Azir mm -hmm. um, uh, on that time. And uh, it, that's the same sort of format that we tend to do each Ev time. Each Action year? and engagement as well. Uh -huh. each, every couple of years it takes. Every to couple of years. Yes, there has been a lot of uh, uh, media coverage on that. Because I think you made an impact within the Bangladeshi community in Bangladesh mm. uh, about the work you have done, and also inspiration from the British Bangladeshi community here. Well, I think that's 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 mm. rewarding. That's nice to know because uh, it's extraordinary when I tell people about why you know how I got involved in mm. Bangladesh. Um, English people here they don't really understand the fact that there's half a million British Bangladeshis, and that's so many of them, such a high percentage of them, come from Sylhet. Yes. There's one town. You know, they would assume that maybe in lots of diaspora groups tend to come from the capital city but coming from one particular one city in the region, area around yeah. it, the villages around it. Um, speak I think the same uh, yeah, surprise, Yes, yeah, surprises a lot of people pleasantly, I think. Do you understand one or two things? I, I've, I've made a few speeches in, in uh, Bengali and uh, I think when I was teaching primary school children mm -hmm. uh, last time in the tea gardens at, mm -hmm. in Silet, they taught me how to count from one to ten, one to ten. which I then had to do in front of the president, president of Bangladesh. So uh, I, d I do wonder what, you know, what he thought of me. Who's this guy coming over here speaking, one, counting from one to ten? Yeah, but uh, no, that's, I was never going to be the chancellor if I could only count that much. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, in 2015, you went again after becoming an MP. That's right. And again, we did similar things. So we went back to the uh, to the sports academy and saw, and it was really a follow up. We played cricket and football with the kids mm -hmm. that we'd helped set up in the first place. We went back to the school that we'd uh, helped to refurbish and saw what had happened since. And that was a really lovely experience. It's a fantastic experience, just seeing how things have progressed and moved on over that period. And then what more we could do to add a little bit of extra value mm -hmm. as well. And the children at school, how did they what well, was actually, their reaction? To, to be fair, unfortunately, we didn't see the secondary school children because okay. it was uh, it was Eid. Okay. Uh, so when when we were there, so um, uh, so we didn't see the children, but we saw the chairman of governors and a number of uh, mm -hmm. we saw some children, mm -hmm. but a number of the people, the staff that we'd seen before. I mean, knowing that it was Eid, I remember when I went to Dhaka, everyone said, "Don't worry, the traffic's going to be fine because it's holidays." Uh, for us, it's still a lot of traffic. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I want to move on um, about your involvement with the curry industry, mm. and um, you are in the you are uh, your position is. So, it's the chairman of the all-party parliamentary group for the British curry, curry catering industry. industry. But uh, as I say, curry minister, I think is uh, is a lot snappier. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and um, as you know, and we have had discussion about the problem within the curry industry, the decline of the curry industry. And Channel S is doing s something, uh, and you are a part of it. <laughs> On the other hand, in the parliament, the catering organizations are meeting you and you are speaking on our behalf. Mm. Tell us about that. Well, I think everybody knows the situation of the curry industry. It's a success story for the for, for Britain and, and mm. British Bangladeshis, uh, having the, the, the favorite dish of, uh, of, of, of Britain at the moment, the chicken tikka masala, having 100,000 people working in the industry and contributing so much to our GDP. 4.2 billion. Well, exactly, but the, you know, the, the thing is it's, um, uh, it, it has struggled for a number of years and for a number of different reasons. That's, um, you know, it's partly marketing, it's partly prices, it's partly, um, uh, you know, working out how to get to the next level. Um, but underpinning a lot of this is the um, staffing of the kitchens yeah. and making sure that there are skilled chefs in there to do that. Now, my view has always been the very long term view. Um, it needs to be, uh, we need to be domestically training our own chefs. But the, th that's not good enough to help restaurants at the moment at the moment. survive and thrive. We do need a transitional period when we can actually do more on the immigration side to allow skilled chefs yeah. to come in. In order to bring a chef, there are so many restrictions and you have to have affiliated, certified by the home office and so on and so forth. So for the Bangladeshi catering industry, it has become impossible to bring somebody over here. How? What can you do to help us? I think we have the opportunity in the next couple of years, because with Brexit, the government are reviewing their overall immigration policy, and so this is something that we can do, and we, but we've got to get it right, because we'll only get one chance at this. And I think the one thing that I would be really disappointed if we don't get is this anomaly that they have on the, um, uh, the shortage occupation list when they talk about skilled chefs is that the lower income threshold doesn't count for any restaurant that has a takeaway element. Now, 
tell me which curry restaurants don't have takeaways. It's, it's, uh, they're just next to none. There may be a, just a couple of Michelin star ones mm -hmm. in London, but, but apart from that, no, every restaurant uh, has a takeaway element. So that, that, to my mind, they're unfairly penalized for that. And so that's something I think is an, an anomaly. It is an unintended un consequence. And that's something I think we can really start to work on immediately. And then the rest of it, getting that transition period, um, will be will take a little bit of time and take a little bit of persuasion because we've still got to remember that the government's aim, overall aim, is to reduce net migration. So they're not necessarily going to be... We'll come back in a second. Yeah, Let's a take a break and we'll continue our discussion. Welcome back. Uh, the, on the Friends of Bangladesh program, we are talking to Paul Scully MP, and we are talking about various issues relating to the catering industry at the moment. Uh, so I'm going to continue with the catering industry. And Paul, uh, so we are talking about the staff shortages. Mm, mm. <coughs> and one thing we have found, and me being a caterer, is, you know, all the time, during the election, and I have said it many times, we get politicians saying that we'll do this, we'll do that for you, uh, but nothing ha really happens. Mm. I understand that there is a barrier with the uh, capping of the immigration, but we feel that the government of the day is failing to understand that th this is a British curry industry. It is their own industry, and it is dying. If it dies, there would be a lot of unemployment un within the community. So, yeah. tell us. Well, look, I think I think from what you've just said, the logic of that, if it's a British industry, it should be staffed by British people. Yeah. So, actually, what we've got to say is, yes, it is a British. Um, it's it's becoming, and it's a, you know, it's British Bangladeshis that are doing it. And as I said um, earlier on, that I think the long-term view is that it would be domestic training that would actually keep it on a level playing field uh, for forevermore. But it's these next few years that we've really got to get through um, to help um, people because we talked about curry colleges years ago, didn't we? Back in 2010, I think it was, that Eric Pickles was trying to set up. Um, but they never really took off. Now, that was because, from what I understood, it was because um, they, you know, they, it was difficult to set up. There weren't enough people to actually do the training and it was trying to attract people to actually come in and, and be trained. Um, but in the meantime, what we've got to persuade the government is that we need this transition period. We need to be bringing people over, especially to, uh, to man restaurants that have got a takeaway element, but it's not being used as a, um, a backdoor way of increasing immigration, of bringing people over that way, because that's the sort of default position but that the uh, government's gone down over the last few years. When it comes to homegrown people, yeah. from my experience, I have found you know, the initiative taken by Eric Pico mm. and the talk about doing this and that, training institute, but you can have a training institute, and as you said, there weren't much interested mm. people coming in. Yeah. But the failure of the government is encouraging, failing to encourage the young unemployed people to come into this training institutes. Mm. No incentives were given. For, so imagine if the government departments worked with the employment agencies, social services, and identified people, and if they sort of encourage them to go for training and government gives them in, in financial incentives, mm. then of course they will go for training. Mm. So that's where there has been a failure and work has to be done on that. The other issue is um, the amount you said is high, we know, and the problem, if you serve takeaway in your restaurant, you cannot bring anybody. You cannot get a license. Yeah. You are right. But I feel, and the community, and the catering community mm. feel that there is a communication gap, and the government is not addressing, trying to listen and address the issues. Um, so I think there has to be a dialogue. 
I totally agree with you and this is what I want to help achieve because I, I don't really want to be doing things just to talk about it. I want to be able to you know, have, mm -hmm. do things that I can promise that I can try and get resolved that are achievable. Uh, I would say politics is the art of the possible. And so you're absolutely right. We need to have that dialogue. There's no reason why the, the government would be really successful in other areas of working on apprenticeship, uh, apprenticeships and these kind of things. Um, there's no reason we can't like do it in the kitchen. decades ago, I worked on, uh, as an advisor on New Deal programme. Right, yeah. So yeah. there could be something like absolutely. that. Absolutely. No, absolutely. I'm sure there's more we can do in... in re yeah, in, and in the figure you said about, I said about 4.2 billion mm. we uh, yeah. inject into the economy. It could be 3.5 billion because of the recession. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, absolutely. So it will always fluctuate, mm. and we will never be accurate yeah, on yeah. the figures. Now, what I've keen, and I, I know I've talked about it for a long time, and I, I haven't um, got it done yet because it's it's a, a, a difficult thing to do, is to identify as many restaurants as we can, survey them so we can get as accurate a figure as we can, which will also not only give us those accurate figures, but it will give us the scale of the, um, of the problem in particular areas, so rural versus city, um, the sort of towns outside London, north, south, Scotland, Wales, etc, etc. We can really do a, a detailed study and one of the lovely things but I've had... But we have done it. Catering Circle, more well, or Well, I know you've done a bit, done, you've done yeah. a great job in doing your road yeah. show and I know there's a, a number of organisations that are, but I know the Catering Circle haven't been involved in it, has been a, has done a fantastic job on this, but the uh, the University of South Wales have also agreed to uh, do some analysis of the, mm -hmm. the data when we get the survey up and running. But we cannot wait forever. If there, imagine if there were funding, government funding, mm. given to your, uh, under you, mm. it can happen within a couple of months. Yeah, but then you you know what we what we aiming for? This is what we said. Well, what are we aiming for? We started off talking about immigration, and we we we're ending up talking about um, apprenticeship and new deals. So I think both of these can be uh, parts of the solution. What we've got to find out is up to what. Uh, proportion they can be part of the solution because I know that to go to the government and ask for an open door immigration policy to, to, to fund skill shares will never get off the ground okay. so it's just trying to get the balance right of, yes we can open the door that much but also we need to be looking at transition phase okay. I want to stop it there ways. because it's a lengthy uh, discussion you know it can take hours yeah but Brexit yeah when there was issue about Brexit stay with EU or not, mm. overwhelmingly, the British Bangladeshi community voted for Brexit mm -hmm. because we were given the hope that after Brexit there, there will be incentives given to the catering industry and also there was another issue, Commonwealth to be revived. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, look, I think both of those uh, are, are there. Um, one, one of the things that we talked about, the fundamental of Brexit, was to take control. Um, and so if we come back to the immigration situation, it was never a, a I remember speaking on, on any number of platforms saying, well, look, you know, that's not going to necessarily change the immigration situation, but the immigrant, because this is nothing to do with the EU, it's to do with our government, but we're always being driven by the European Union. So bringing immigration back to the UK, to our control, then it means that when we're lobbying the government, we have direct access to people that would make decisions based on what's happening here and now, rather than in the EU. So I still think that can happen. In terms of finances, if we got a great product in the British curry, um, as we've been discussing, there's no reason why we can't get the government fully behind that in terms of, uh, in terms of helping if we can put the, um, the right deal forward for them to do so. But in terms of the Commonwealth, I actually spent, um, I've spent uh, some time with Andrew Rosendell, who does a lot of work for the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association over the last few weeks, talking to other countries about exactly that, about how we revitalize our relationship, not just with the Commonwealth, but actually introduce other countries into closer trading relationships with that Commonwealth as well. And CSLs really is the glue between um, these trading relationships. So I, th I see a really positive, exciting trading future for this country, both with our uh, former com Commonwealth partners who we that, whose relationships we let dwindle and other com emerging economies as well. Can you arrange a dialogue between the catering industry um, and the government? With this, your is what, this is what I absolutely aim to do. This is what Argently. I absolutely aim to Argently. do. Yeah, yeah. This is every week. Yeah. A couple yeah. of them are closing. No, this is what I am today. Uh, as I say, I think if we just get it all, we all get together and just have one single ask of the government, then that just that's going to make life a lot easier. And so it's really making sure that all of the different groups, the catering groups, are working together for one aim, and that's the and that is the future of the catering industry, not just to make it survive, but to make it thrive again.
Thank uh, you. And if we can come back together, then we very can quickly, aim. very quickly, tell us about trade relations between Bangladesh and. Uh, UK. Well, again, it comes back to the Commonwealth. I, I, you know, I'm really looking forward to speaking to uh, to uh, the politicians in in Bangladesh when I go over in September, uh, and I really want to specifically talk uh, to. We, we often, when we go, talk about social action and these kind of things, which I want to do. But I also want to speak to businesses to work out the sectors that we can develop as well, because it's all great having a. a it's very welcome having non-resident Bangladeshis investing back in the country. But actually, what we want to do, what I really want to do, is to interest. Um, uh, English people, British people uh, that ha don't know anything about Bangladesh to actually th use half a million British Bangladeshis to champion Bangladesh for all of the good things that it does really, really well. I'll give you one example, IT. If you have a business that's looking to outsource their IT or maybe looking for programmers and coders, you tend to look to India because it's a big market, Thank it's you. a huge market. Thank you. Let's go to Bangladesh. Last question, we are running out of mm. time, is what is your opinion about the British Bangladeshi community? Well, what I found that they've done is that we've talked a lot about catering because everybody knows someone that's rooted in the catering industry, uh, family and friends, etc. But they've moved on, second and third generation. Diversifying. Into the law, into banking, into finance, into IT, or medicine, law, politics, etc. And that's what's fantastic. There are inspirational British Bangladeshis in every corner of community uh, and, and industry in this country. And that's got to be really, really good. So half a million pe people are definitely punching above their weight. So your message to the community and to the catering industry for the for, in well, for, for, for me I'm delighted to be and proud to be a friend of British Bangladeshis to the catering industry stick with it let's speak as one voice and then we can get something out of the government to British Bangladeshis at whole keep doing what you're doing because you're doing an amazing job in inspiring the next generation of British Bangladeshis coming up in so many different fields. Paul Scully thank you very much for coming to the studio viewers uh, today we have learned lot from Paul Scully MP about the catering industry, about the Bangladeshi community in Britain, and also Bangladesh. Soon, we'll be back with a new uh, face, and a new friend of Bangladeshi, so stay tuned. Thank you.